Hi, and welcome to another show of Arena Labs, where we're having casual conversations with the scientific community of Austria. This has been an exciting week, and we've learned so, so much. Today, I'm here, and I'm going to say apologize in advance, because I'm not sure how to get this name right, but Barbara Van Kuba. Can you repronounce that name? Make sure. Yeah, my name is Barbara Van Kuba. Thank you for being with us. This has been a very uh, special time in learning uh, and sharing knowledge with scientific community and I'm so excited to talk about your specialty and what you've done and the contributions in your life. So can you take me back to, well first of all, let's talk about what you do now and then we want to go back to how you started. Well, uh, my official position is Director General for Scientific Research and International Relations at the Austrian Ministry of Education, Science and Research. Um, which means in practice um, trying to provide framework conditions um, to enable research um, and science in Austria to foster uh, and international cooperation to grow and a special focus is on the European Union. Wow, yeah, that's awesome. I want to understand um, how one gets started. How did you fall into this or mm -hmm. take us back to that moment where you're like, I'm going to start in this direction and then how that path led? Well, it actually started in the United States uh, when I was a Fulbrighter um, in 86, 87 at the University of Illinois, Chicago, where I did a master program in communications, focusing on international intercultural communication and also worked as a teaching assistant um, and got quite excited about how they dealt with international students, student orientation um, and student advising and talked about that um, at my home university, the University of Graz, mm -hmm. um, during Christmas break, um, which made the university um, decide, actually, um, and the rector um, to set up an international office at the university. Wow. Um, and I was hired as the first staff member after coming back from the U.S. What was that like? It was exciting. It was fun. Um, I had no idea what would be the outcome, um, but it was just fascinating of, of actually um, creating your own environment um, because there was just one professor, um, also pro bono actually, um, chairing the, the whole venture. Um, and I was the only one um, employed at the office. Um, and we jointly tried to build up the international cooperation and exchange programs of the university. At that point, did you know how much impact it would have? No, never ever. Wow. And we were talking a little bit ago about the desire to uh, internal to, to do this was languages, your interest in languages. Yeah, I've, I've always loved languages already uh, when I was at school um, and wanted to be a translator and interpreter to link different cultures, um, different nations. Mm -hmm. um, and that was um, actually why I chose to, to inter, intercultural communications. Mm -hmm. Uh, which definitely helped then also in, in working in international settings. When the Iron Curtain fell, mm -hmm. um, Austria being a neighboring country to a lot of Central and Eastern European countries, uh, we supported their higher education and research system mm -hmm. um, by scholarship programs and also um, by capacity building, um, including also research infrastructure, which was not available in these countries, so they could come and train at the University of Graz. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, that was in the in the 90s, um, and Austria joined the European Union uh, in the mid 90s. Mid 90s. Um, and before that, um, we were able to take part in some of the EU programs um, for education and research. Um, so the Erasmus program is the best known, which is a mobility program for students and teachers. Um, and our university was so successful that I was hired to go to Vienna mm -hmm. and took over the agency. Um, at a time before Austria joined the European Union. And um, when Austria joined the European Union, um, I became um, director in the ministry in charge of um, education and higher education. And I've been working with the ministry responsible for science and research ever then, mm -hmm. um, mostly involved in European and international relations, but also um, science and research. Mm -hmm. um, and the, in, within Europe, um, there is um, something that is called the European Research Area being built up. Um, actually, 28 countries for the time being, and as of next year, unfortunately, without the UK, it will only be 27, mm -hmm. um, trying to 
enable researchers to move freely uh, between the countries, but also knowledge to travel freely. So knowledge transfer is an important element um, and joint cooperation also internationally. So it's 27 or for the time being 28 countries um, meeting regularly um, in Brussels or in individual countries. We take turns. So every half year, another EU country is chairing the so-called Council of the European Union. And Austria has the pleasure and the honor uh, since July 1st this year until December 31st uh, to be the, the president of the European Union. So we were hosting over 40 events in higher education and research in Austria and also chairing the council meetings, negotiating. And then um, it was twice on the formal level and once the informal level, the ministers of all the 28 EU member states uh, meeting, discussing and actually finalizing the negotiation um, on the seven-year program for research and innovation um, in the European Union. So that was a political decision and now it will be negotiated with the European Parliament, mm -hmm. um, which includes again uh, parliamentarians from all 28 member states being elected on the European Parliament elections. Um, and by the end of 2020, we will have a new program um, running for seven years, yeah. um, but not just for researchers in Europe, uh, no matter which citizenship they have, but also international collaboration is an element of this program. Yeah. So countries can associate to take part and um, the United States for the time being um, are an associate partner, so they can also take part in, in the research projects. So what's fascinating to me about that is that... Um, your path, as far as I started here and I saw this, um, it, it sounds like the the change of the future, what you were able to see, uh, even from the very beginning of your career, is how do I help connect people? How do I help connect people across the pond in all sorts of areas? Um, what are some of the, the things that you've seen throughout your life as far as the, the, the positive benefits that you've seen by the work that you do? Well, I've been uh, very much involved in, in Southeast Europe. In the late 90s, um, there was actually the, the Kosovo War um, in, uh, between Serbia and, and Kosovo. Um, and we were very active in Southeast Europe um, already when uh, Yugoslavia fell apart and the individual um, democratic um, republics uh, developed out of, of Yugoslavia and supported um, Southeast Europe in, in becoming um, closer to the European standards in higher education and research. Um, and then especially um, with Kosovo, um, we supported um, teachers, researchers at the, at the individual universities in Kosovo, um, and we're also supporting student networks and um, a regional program that was set up um, in the in the 90s, um, the Central European Initiative for um, University um, Projects uh, programs, um, helping to these countries um, which would not cooperate among each other any longer to to start um, joint cooperation again um, by exchanging students um, and teachers, um, and each country provides scholarships. So it's, you didn't have to exchange money, which is, of okay. course, always a challenge, especially yeah. with poorer countries. Mm -hmm. So they just offer places at their dormitories or provide um, cafeteria meals um, so everyone could afford it. Okay. Um, and what was nice to see that there were networks um, where you had um, former countries, countries having been in war before, uh, to cooperate, um, Serbia and Kosovo and Bosnia and Croatia and Macedonia, um, included in an academic network, um, developing a joint curriculum um, in humanities, for instance, mm. or um, some of the projects um, in, in medicine where through this cooperation, um, the training could be improved so you could actually save lives. Oh. Um, so things like that uh, are very, uh, where you see the sustainability of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And we're also supporting a program, uh, Open Medical Seminars, um, which is co-financed um, actually by George Soros and, and his Open Science Foundations um, and our ministry, um, and has been 
we have been doing this uh, for many years, um, with support of uh, doctors, medical doctors, um, in Southeast Europe, um, Central Europe, and also other developing countries, where they're brought um, to, to Austria to, to a seminar being taught by medical doctors from the US, um, um, Columbia University, for instance, uh, and Austrian universities um, over a certain period of time, just a week or two. Mm -hmm. um, but they are kept in the network. So once they go back home, they can always uh, get back to the to their supervisors, um, and they are helped in 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 training, also in, with workshops in their countries, yeah. um, with the positive result that they are not leaving their countries. Mm -hmm. Um, and with some in Albania or Montenegro, up to 14% of the medical doctors have been going through the training. Mm. Um, and the sustention rate is quite high. Uh -huh. So because they feel as part of a network, they mm -hmm. have the newest um, methods and they know um, that they, they can always go back and, and have additional training. Mm -hmm. So it's it's that kind it's of activities. Network, yeah. um, and it, it's, it's building networks again. It's mm -hmm. like the Austrian scientists in North America. Uh, network where we support the Austrian academics and researchers in Canada and the US mm -hmm. just by bringing them together once a year yeah. and um, also um, awarding um, three Astina awards uh, where we showcase um, some that were very successful in publishing in, in the US in the mm -hmm. past year. Um, which shows them that there is this um, appreciation of the Republic of Austria for what they're doing. Very nice. That's so fascinating that all of that work's uh, been done. So I, I, you explained the the path of what happened. Did you have a family background in science, or was it was it just well, something I've, that? I've always liked languages, um, and um, I, I went to a school where I could um, have French, uh, Latin, and English, and I loved languages and uh, was able to. Uh, work as an au pair uh, during summer holidays when I was 17 in France for a month. Mm -hmm. um, and I always um, tried to learn additional languages and always wanted to become an interpreter. Wow. Um, and was quite good at school. And luckily in Austria, you don't have to pay tuition fee. Um, so you can afford um, college um, easily. Um, and I've, I was working all, all the time when, when I went to college, um, teaching actually, mm -hmm. <laughs> privately. Um, and um, I, I started um, English and French as an interpreter and translator. Uh, and after a few semesters, um, actually in the fourth semester, um, I in interpreted for a South African um, freedom fighter um, on, on the International Women's Day. And realized that I could never do the interpretation for an official government representative in the apartheid regime. Um, and that was when I decided not to become an interpreter, uh, but only a translator. And I switched to American studies, um, English and American studies, because I was always fascinated with the U.S. What and, languages do you speak? Um, well, I, I, my mother tongue, my native tongue, um, to put it politically correct, is, is German, um, and English is kind of the second, became the second language. Uh, French, some Spanish, um, and they had some courses in Russian and Croatian, but that got lost over the time. Okay. But I, I love languages. Italian is easy because I had Latin, and so I can read a little. So German, Italian, German, French. Yeah, German, well, German, English, French are quite good, and then I can read a few others. Okay, really fascinating. Um, so it's, it's the it's I love the path. It's the fascination of languages, and, and it then, fell into part. It it was not. I, I didn't decide to become. I, I never wanted to become an official actually, and, and now I'm a civil servant in the ministry. Mm -hmm. That was not the career path. Yeah. Um, it was something. I I just loved um, international cooperation, yeah. um, and and the European Union programs. And when we joined the European Union, um, it had to be someone. Um, a civil servant representing the Republic of Austria. Mm -hmm. So I had to actually join the ministry and become a civil servant mm -hmm. to do that. And I always loved to be in, in Brussels in meetings and negotiations mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. yeah, and contribute. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure that that works. Uh, the work has got both amazing rewards, but there's also probably, because there's 
diplomacy involved in politics. I'm sure there's a lot of frustrations as well. Oh yeah, um, but I'm very persistent, so it's uh, it, that helps. Um, yeah, it, it definitely it's it's quite um, frustrating when you sometimes in in international negotiations and we have partners all around the the globe, um, and of course. Um, Science diplomacy is also um, trying to negotiate with uh, cultures which are quite different. Um, the most challenging experiences are definitely in countries uh, like Saudi Arabia, um, where um, they treat women differently. Um, mm. And I was head of delegation um, for education for a high education working group, mm-hmm. um, and that's um, quite challenging. All of a sudden, that you have to cover yourself um, and cannot shake hands um, and still um, be at the same level in the negotiation and the partnership. Right. I, it, it would, I can only imagine, but it, um, it, it could definitely, I could see the frustration in that just because are they really hearing and respecting what you're saying when they're having these other demands? Well, the, the, the positive outcome was that we got uh, the agreement the way we wanted it uh, in the beginning. Yeah. So that was at least the, <laughs> the success was on our side. But it was quite challenging. It was um, the, the Austrian delegation, mm-hmm. about one third was women. Yeah. Um, and it was um, the same challenge for all of us because sometimes they just wanted to talk to the men, but right. they were not the leaders. They were not the heads of delegation. Mm-hmm. So that was also... Um, it's part of yeah, explaining your own culture um, mm. by by doing that to other yeah to other countries yeah um, that's that's really incredible interesting as far as as far as uh, where this work has taken you uh, into other countries and and you know having these these kind of conversations um, what challenges do you see now today that you're trying you're you're moving and pushing forward what's the agenda now that I'm you, that is in your well, heart. The, the, the world has become quite challenging, um, as we all realize when we watch um, news and the media. And um, in the field of research, um, with the, the global challenges we all face, be it um, climate change, um, scarce resources, um, the demographic change, um, there's a lot of pressure on research to provide answers. Yeah. Um, and we try um, to provide framework conditions that make it possible to have answers quicker, because we all realize that um, time is running. Mm -hmm. Um, So on the one hand, it's more funding for science and research, both on the national, but also on the European Union level. And also um, putting a focus on mission-oriented research, uh, that you start with the research question um, for water, for instance. I mean, the discussion on plastic in oceans. Um, So healthy water is an issue um, across the globe. Uh, and you need to put the right people together because it's not just um, researchers uh, dealing with the ocean, but you need um, legal experts because it's also about international treaties, international laws. Um, you need uh, social sociologists and psychologists because people have to, to act differently um, in order not to have plastic in oceans. Um, so that, that kind of new approaches to research are also important. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course... Um, international cooperation because um, these questions are so big and, and right. so important yeah. um, and for some of them you need um, big data you need large-scale infrastructure mm-hmm. uh, which one country cannot actually yeah. build by its own or afford by its own right. so within the European Union we have this strategy forum for research infrastructure where we come up with roadmaps that are jointly adopted by all the member states and then implemented uh, where one country takes a lead for one infrastructure and another one for another, and then you you try to have members uh, contributing um, in order to, to to help solve uh, some of these big issues. So one of the things that you mentioned was funding, um, and from a layman's perspective, I'm going to tell you that for a long time I've been very interested in in ocean conservancy and all the things that you mm-hmm. just talked about, the climate change and and the things that we just discussed. And in my mind, as a business owner, it's, okay, I'm going to go look for a nonprofit that's doing this work. But what I'm hearing you say is, that's one way to help. But there's another way to help, potentially, is look for the scientists that are doing the work and see if they need funding. Is that, mm-hmm. is that how does one go about 
doing that, I guess. Is, if the audience yeah. is listening and they're like, yeah, you know, I want to support what you're doing, how would I want to do that? Well, there are more and more researchers actually um, trying to involve citizens already uh, when they define their research question. And this is something, at least um, in, in Europe, um, we are putting a focus on that the researchers should actually um, try to solve the right um, issues. Um, so we have some pilot projects, um, for instance, in child psychiatry, uh, where um, the general public was asked, um, those that are concerned, parents, uh, nurses, um, teachers, uh, doctors, um, what questions do they have that they have not gotten an answer yet? Um, and a lot of feedback came. Then you have um, experts uh, that go through all these um, responses because some of them will already have answers, but they simply do not know where to find them. Right. Right. But then there, there were some research questions defined that have never been dealt with. Um, and there was a call um, for interest for researchers and interdisciplinary research teams were built so because you needed um, the medical side, you needed the, the sociologists, the psychologists, um, but also some practitioners. Mm -hmm. And the research group was set up in a way that they always involved also parents' association um, and um, nurses and, and, and practitioners in order to define um, their research in a way that the answers would then also be used or could be used immediately mm -hmm. um, in practice. And th this is called responsible science and citizen science. Um, and these initiatives are quite popular already in, in Europe and also in some parts of the US. Mm -hmm. and I think that's the way to do it. Yeah, yeah. So as you were talking about that, it makes me think and compare to, um, you know, one of the issues in that I talk to a lot of founders about, especially starting companies, whether it's new technologies or whatever they're trying to start to impact the world, uh, is funding, is one of the questions. And so now you've got various, everybody's looking for how to get funded for their company um, or a nonprofit that we talk to as well. But some of the things out there is like crowdsourcing to, to fund that. Is there anything in the science community that's got a crowdsource that the public can just go fund and then be used for science that you know of. I don't know that there is from. Well, um, it, it's it's probably it's crowdsourcing and crowdfunding because um, sometimes it's not just the money, but you need you need the people um, to have the right information, oh. um, which is also fascinating because you can involve um, schools and pupils as well. Mm -hmm. um, so you you simply um, uh, very easy examples are um, in nature where you. You have certain kinds of, of uh, birds or butterflies um, and you want to find out if in a certain region they are still there um, yeah. or if the number has decreased or increased. Um, so you will ask a, a question to the general public and they can send you um, a text message uh, okay. or a WhatsApp with a picture. Yeah. Um, we do the same with the Austrian Meteorological um, agency um, with certain uh, weather forecasts, um, because Austria being an alpine country, um, weather can be quite different from one valley to the next. Okay. So if there's a thunderstorm and people take pictures and send the WhatsApp, um, they have much more information than they have through their weather stations that are, of course, wow. not um, mobile. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that works quite well. So they are, there's actually an impact citizens can have on research. Uh, by contributing themselves and also have fun at the same time. Wow. And we have um, awards that we provide for um, citizens that get involved in mm -hmm. research. Mm -hmm. Once a year, um, we have uh, programs where we involve schools mm -hmm. that come up with their own projects and then um, actually come up with a concrete result, mm -hmm. uh, working with researchers at the same level. From the sounds of it, it sounds like this is not a top-down approach. It's more like we got there's so many issues that pick an issue that is near to your heart, exactly. and then and then go find people that'll help you with the studies as far as the scientists go and in interdisciplinary science, sciences and community, and then find funding to do that. So it's a, it's a multiple thing that needs to come up with. It's not 
And it's sort of like, here's like 10 it's issues. It's not linear, no. Exactly. Yeah. There's not, here's 10 issues that the whole world is needing to fix. Although there's, there's some of those. <laughs> but, and how do we go do that? I'm sure there's already that. But there's all these other things that we're not thinking of. And uh, which is re- really cool because um, it allows you to actually follow what's your concern, what's in your heart, mm-hmm. right? Like, what's doing that? So that that's uh, a very um, interesting thing that I didn't realize about the scientific community. So for the audience that's out there, we've got all types of people listening. Some will be students in college just trying to figure out what their career path mm-hmm. is. For those that are interested in science and international studies, what would your advice be? Well, um, if they should do what they really want to do, um, because then they're good at doing what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are so many opportunities um, doing science and research, not just at universities, but also in research organizations outside of universities, but also in companies. Yeah. Um, and they could also start their own small business doing research. I mean, there are wow. a lot of consulting companies in social sciences, mm-hmm. um, which is also research. Yeah. Is there, in, and I don't know this, is there a general directory of of I want to do research in this, is it just a Google search, I'm going to do research in this and just figure out who's doing research? Or is there a place that people could go and see some organized companies that are doing this? Or Well, I, the easiest is probably uh, once one is already at a university or at a college, um, then you probably find out easily what you're most interested in. And usually the teachers, the professors... Okay. Um, the, and the uh, research um, you, you are getting involved in, you then know who are the best people in the world and, and um, will find them. Um, before that, at, at the school level, there are quite some universities and research organizations um, reaching out to the general public and involving mm-hmm. uh, citizens um, and also pupils in research projects. Mm-hmm. And that can usually be found either through the communities um, or um, on the internet. What's the future look like for you? What are you trying to accomplish with the end goal? Well, um, there is, uh, for the time being, the, the focus is, of course, um, in research on trying to solve some of the great challenges that the world faces um, through more mission orienta- orientation in research. Um, so you start with the large research question, like, um, healthy waters. Um, One of the issues is the plastic-free oceans, for instance, Mm -hmm. where you need um, interdisciplinary research groups and definitely international cooperation in in solving some of the issues, um, which are not just related um, to the fact that you have the plastic in the ocean, but what does this plastic do with the water? Um, And you need um, legal experts because it's international treaties. you need psychologists and um, sociologists because you need to change the behavior of, of the human beings um, in order to prevent uh, more littering. Um, so it's it's always very interesting to have these uh, mixed approaches. Mm-hmm. And in, in some of the areas of research for, for climate change, for instance, you also need um, data analysis and big data and, and large infrastructures in some mm-hmm. cases, which you cannot have in one country, but you have to build together. I would think that in addition to changing pattern behavior of humans uh, or people, that you also have to think about the corporations and businesses that are producing this and how, to, how, how can they be more responsible. And I would imagine that can be frustrating because... On one side, you have businesses that have, you know, dollars and cents that they're trying to, to create. And they found some efficient ways to produce products at a certain cost budget, but yet it's not healthy for the environment. So how do, what does that look like? Is that frustrating or is there a lot of cooperation or what are you seeing? Usually um, there's a lot of um, social responsibility already uh, in businesses um, and you can... M- also see it in the startup sector um, where the new generation is um, having a strong focus actually on on environmental friendly uh, new Mm -hmm. gadgets and and, and tools and instruments. Um, And I think you you just need to have a convincing case. Um, And and also large companies um, will quickly adapt to consumer needs. Uh, So it's probably uh, once there is this change in society, um, companies will definitely follow. Amazing. 
Well, thank you so much for being with us today. Really enjoyed this conversation. I learned a lot. I know our audience is also going to benefit. Well, thank you for having me.